Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at Jadavpur University. In this module, we will be discussing the poetry of the Nobel laureate Derek Walcott. Derek Walcott comes from the island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean and is not only a poet but also a painter, a dramatist and a fiction writer. Poetry says Derek Walcott in his Nobel lecture, conjugates both tenses simultaneously. The past and the present. There is the buried language and there is the individual vocabulary. And the process of poetry is one of excavation and self-discovery. The binaries of past and present, the dichotomies of the original and mimicry inform his view of the exchange between the native and the other. This is the core of the Caribbean consciousness, which moulds the imposed English language to forge a plurality out of the divided existence that Walcott's lives and poems epitomize. Through this, Walcott not only tries to find his own individual identity, but also to craft a transnational identity for the Caribbean islands and for the African diaspora. Let us start with the consideration of Walcott's life. Walcott was born on 23rd January 1930 in Castries, St. Lucia, the child of a civil servant and a school teacher. Both of his grandfathers were white and both his grandmothers were slaves. Both France and England colonized St. Lucia and Walcott's poems show the influences of both the languages. However, he was exposed to English literature and classics through his British education. Moreover, his mother was a school teacher who recited English poetry at home. His father painted and wrote poetry, but Walcott's father died before he was born. The divided consciousness that caused a feeling of rootlessness began in childhood itself when Walcott had to face two languages and cultures inside and outside the education system. Through art and poetry, Walcott tried to address and bridge the gap between his two identities. In that simple schizophrenic boyhood, one could lead two lives, he says the interior life of poetry and the outward life of action and dialect. When he was 14 years old, he published his first poem and by 19, he self-published two poetry collections called 25 Poems, coming out in 1948, and Epitaph for the Young, 12 Cantos in 1949. He moved to Trinidad in 1953 where he formed a group of actors and founded the Trinidad Theatre Workshop in 1959. Mimicry and other African and Caribbean performance traditions, folk songs and a blend of languages are amalgamated in most of his plays and poems. His collection, In a Green Night, Poems 1948 to 1960, which was published in 1962, received international recognition. Later, he travelled to Boston and at Boston University, he founded Boston Playwrights Theatre in 1981. He taught literature and writing at Boston University until he retired in 2007. His book-length poem, Omiros, written in 1990, won the Nobel Prize in 1992. His later collections include The Bounty, 1997, Taipolo's Hound, 2000, The Prodigal, 2004, and White Egrets, 2010. Walcott is a man of many cultures, standing at the confluence of African, colonialist, and Caribbean traditions, a self-described mulatto of styles. In his review on collected poems, 1948 to 1984, James Dickey describes Walcott thus, he is a 20th century man living in the West Indies and in Boston. 
poised between the blue sea and its real fish, its coral reefs and gigantic turtles, between a lapsed colonial culture and the industrial north, between Africa and the west, between slavery and intellectualism, between the native Caribbean tongue and English learned from books, between the black and white in his own body, between the sound of the home ocean and the lure of European culture. This gives us an insight into the themes and motives of Walcott's poetry, which we will discuss in detail next. Walcott's first published collection of poems, named 25 Poems, had influences of the Western literary tradition. Though he has followed Western literary techniques and forms, the West Indian landscapes, seascapes, and other natural motives engage in his poetry the task of developing a tradition far from the Western. Regional and folk traditions blended with the European, spoken in a mixture of native Patois and British English. These are the thematic and linguistic techniques that define Walcott's poetry. The poet's image as an exile yearning to find home is continuously repeated in most of his poems especially in The Castaway and other poems published in 1964. Here, Walcott narrates the experiences of the island from the point of view of an outsider and explorer, Robinson Crusoe. The existence of an artist who is isolated from the idea of home is even more complicated when he is divided between the past and the present. That particular experience of nothingness is the space for creativity for the Caribbean Adam in Walcott's thought. He turns this nothingness into twilight, where both identities, the African and the colonial, blend. In The Gulf and other poems, published in 1969, Walcott uses the metaphor of the Gulf that separates his island, St. Lucia, and the other Caribbean islands from the United States and denotes the division between his colonial past and the post-colonial present. His book-length autobiographical poem, Another Life, published in 1973, revisits these themes, especially by focusing on the importance of memory and history, which can be created and recreated through poetry. He takes up the responsibility of creating history from sea, sand, water, and surf. In the absence of the real, the monuments, myths, epic, history, and tribal memory, Walter keeps the sea and the landscape as witnesses to the history of the land. Walcott's art arises from what has been called a schizophrenic situation, created from a struggle between two cultural heritages. He has harnessed both to create a unique, creolized style. He describes his schizophrenic existence in What the Twilight Says, an autobiographical essay published in 1970. His poetry manifests a graceful blending of his sources, European and American, Caribbean and Latino, classical and contemporary. Walcott uses images of generic hybridity and cultural diversity to express the extremity of his identity crisis in a far cry from Africa. I, who am poisoned with the blood of both, where shall I turn, divided to the vein? I, who have cursed the drunken officer of British rule, how choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? Betray them both or give back what they give? How can I face such slaughter and be cool? How can I turn from Africa and live? The identity, the reality and the root come from interaction between the heterogeneous experiences of different areas of life. Walcott is poisoned with the blood of both, divided between cultures and languages of the colonizer and the colonized. Growing up in a blend of culture, and educated in a hybrid system, the poet is confused about where to turn. 
and expresses the burden of a half European and half African ancestry. The struggle of a post-colonial self for whom it is impossible to choose one identity and ignore the other is emphasized in this poem. The education and upbringing of Walcott in an English background seem to have disguised the violent reality of the history of slavery. Hence, in the particular situation described in the poem, Walcott sees everything as an image and the internal quest is to find an authentic identity beyond the shadow of images. The taught or imposed identity and the realized one are obviously different from each other. Divided to the vein, Walcott struggles to find himself and expresses that struggle in a specific local context, thereby accepting the multiplicity of human experience. He describes a different way of living and perceiving and understanding a changed world. In A Far Cry from Africa, Walcott poses the intense question, how choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? This haunts him while he tries to understand himself, his country, the world at large, and the colonial suppression of his divided self. His vocation as a poet and the complex experience of life owing to the dual consciousness that characterizes the Caribbean. The wavering consciousness, unsure whether to betray them both or give back what they give, arises from the realization that the self includes and contains both. He curses the British officer who separated the poet from his roots and heritage through the violence of slavery, but at the same time, he is not able to part from the English language, which has already become an inevitable part of his selfhood. Monuments, battles and martyrs describe the history of a country. However, after decolonization, the Caribbean islands face the accusation of historylessness. Contemporary writers like V. S. Naipaul ascribe this lack of history to the state of the islands as in between, where no one belongs. The white colonizers leave. The Asian indentured laborers have the option of returning home. And in Naipaul's view, the permanent residents of the islands, the slaves who are forced to live there, have no history because they are Africans who come from scriptless cultures. Naipaul discounts this history of pain and violence, which is transmitted not through document, but through orality. Walcott, however, in The Sea is History, says that the monuments, battles, martyrs, the tribal memory, and the whole of history is locked in the sea. Down the centuries, the ocean turns its blank pages in search of history and finally, it discovers a new history in the salt chuckle of rocks with their sea pools. There was the sound like a rumor without any echo of history really beginning. The sea is no more a barrier or border that recalls the lament of the lost original single history. It becomes a link between plural identities to show that at any point in time, history can be made and remade. In the Muse of History, Wal Walcott announces a revelation to mankind in the new world, inhabited by presences, not a creature chained to the past. He picks up the physical features of the land in striking images like shark's shadow, sunlight on the sea floor, and white cowries. But still he realizes that the ocean kept turning blank pages looking for history. There are references to Christianity throughout the poem to show the relation between religion and Caribbean identity. The book of Genesis means birth in Greek and the beginning in Hebrew. This is the first book of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Old Testament. Exodus means departure in Greek and Shermoth means names in Hebrew and in the second book of the Hebrew Bible and the second of the five books of the Torah or the Pentateuch. 
These are some of those religious symbols that Walcott uses. Going through Genesis, Exodus, the Ark of Covenant, Song of Solomon, Jonah and Gomorrah, he finally becomes aware that these signs were all false representations. That was not history, that was only faith, the imposing of a Hebraic or Biblical historical model onto Caribbean and African suffering and identity can be considered as an ironic way of forging history, highlighting the fragmentation and loss of faith in the post-colonial situation. When Walcott proclaims that each rock broke into its own nation, the multiple identities that exist in the Caribbean islands and their relation to the natural world are highlighted. Here, sea is a metaphor for the plural histories hidden under the homogeneous official history, which was a false representation. Walcott gives the diverse landscape, rocks and sea, the authority to create and maintain the history of a land and its inhabitants, whose ancestral memories are erased by a deep amnesiac blow. This phrase, deep amnesiac blow, is a very relevant and significant idea, considering the plurality of viewpoints and diversities of history and civilization in the Caribbean, where the slave trade and the trauma of exploitation and subjugation made the real memories fade into nothingness. This phrase is taken from the poem Laventil, dedicated to V.S. Naipaul. Something inside is laid wide like a wound, some open passage that has cleft the brain, some deep amnesiac blow. We left somewhere a life we never found, customs and gods that are not born again, some crib, some grill of the light clanked shut on us in bondage and withheld us from that world below us and beyond, and in its swaddling ceremonies we are still bound. Identity begins from this wound, the cleft in the brain that led to the loss of the real. All the ancestors of the Caribbeans, except the Amerindians, were brought from elsewhere as slaves, and the resulting cultural subjugation and repression are expressed in the phrase swaddling ceremonies, denoting the helplessness, restriction as well as death to which they are still bound. The dark emptiness of the eroded memories, the deep amnesiac blow, describes the forced forgetting imposed by the violence of slavery. The Caribbean people are now living a life they never found, loss of ancestral memories of the uprooted Africans. Walcott is not nostalgic or pessimistic about that loss, but in his poems he voices a quest for finding the real that is hidden under the perceived signs of history. This quest leads to recognition of the complexities that cannot be molded into a single history. The new postmodern world where the inhabitants like Walcott feel both the wound of an amnesiac blow and the realization of present pluralities, assert and celebrate this very plurality and diversity as their individuality and uniqueness. The next poem we discuss is the Schooner Flight. In this, the chief protagonist is Shabin, a mulatto seafarer, perhaps standing in for Walcott himself. Shabin, in his travel, through the sea that erased his history, tries to find a renewed identity through nature itself. Shabin, who had no nation but the imagination, realizes that this earth is one island in an archipelago of stars. My first friend was the sea, now it is my last, he says. Karanaj, a beaching community in northwest Trinidad, is Shabin's point of departure. With the naming of the place, Walcott contextualizes the Caribbean mulatto Shabin, whose way of living is intertwined with nature around him. In simple speech, my common language, go be the wind, my pages, the sails of the schooner, flight. <laughs> 
Though the poem is primarily about the identity crisis, with a comment that Shabin is any red nigger and at the same time nobody, it is important to know that he is a sailor who journeys towards the past and the future through the waves. In the Caribbean Sea, so choke with dead, Walcott could only find brain, fire, sea fans, dead men's fingers and then the dead men. Shabin, who is separated from his wife, Maria Concepcion and their children, tries to console himself by weeping under water, salt seeking salt. The vision of the cleft rock in the rapturous deep makes him think that he can hide his soul. As in most of the poems of Walcott, the schooner flight is also a journey to find a peaceful land. Where is my rest place, Jesus? Where is my harbour? asks the poet. The single stanza of section 4 of the poem shows how cleverly Walcott employs nature in describing a land to refigure his nation. Dusk, the flight passing, blochicious, gulls wheel like from a gun again, and foam gone amber that was white. Lighthouse and star start making friends. Down every beach the long day ends. And there on that last stretch of sand on a beach bare of all but light, dark hands start pulling in the same of the dark sea deep, deep inland. Like Walcott, Shabin's only possessions and weapons against the loss of his identity are imagination, his creativity and the seascape. I who have no weapons but poetry and the lances of palms and the sea's shining shield. Walcott finds a geography and nature replacing the lack of history and identity. The white clouds, the sea and sky with one seam is clothes enough for my nakedness. The sea in the schooner flight is a healing element while lamenting on the lost green islands, lost in the advent of jet planes and progress, Shabin says, in such fierce salt, let my wound be healed, me in my freshness as a seafarer. In a search for one island that heals with its harbour and a guiltless horizon where the almond's shadow doesn't injure the sand, Shabin discovers that there are so many islands. This discovery corresponds with Walcott's discovery of otherness as he crosses the boundaries of the sea. Comparing the islands to the falling meteors, Walcott says that the fall is necessary for oneness. But things must fall, so it always was. They fall and are one, just as this earth is one island in archipelagos of stars. The acknowledgement and acceptance of the other and through the metaphor of the sea is the cure of the plural society that yearns for an identity. The journey of the fortunate traveller between old and new world, between African roots and Caribbean present, here and elsewhere, by crossing different borders, leaves the poet in a world reconciled by the self. The experience of crossing the border itself, acknowledging the darkness and the twilight. The sea becomes in Walcott that history which includes past as well as present, history as well as individual creation. The sea bridges boundaries, geographically, socially, psychologically. It symbolizes the middle passage and stands for slave trade, colonization, and connects the old and the new worlds, thus redefining received notions of identity. Walcott announces through the voice of Shabin, I am just a red nigger who loved the sea. I had a sound colonial education. I have Dutch, nigger and English in me. And either I am nobody or I am a nation. Walcott finds 
the authentic existence of the artist in himself within a contrasting duality. I am a kind of split writer, he says. I have one tradition inside me going in one way and another tradition going another. The mimetic, the narrative and dance element is strong on one side and the literary, the classical tradition is strong on the other. The vocation of painting inherited from his father and learned from Harold Simmons and Dunstan St. Omer who appear in another life as Harry and Gregorius respectively informs Walcott's literary career. In an interview with Carol B. Fleming, Walcott remembers how when he was young he was taught to believe that the light of the Italian sky was superior to that of the Caribbean sky. However, as he says, I think I got rid of that feeling of inferiority extremely early as a painter practicing the actual skill of painting light, which is what painting is all about, at least representational painting. The initial lines of the first chapter of Another Life embrace both poetry and painting. Verandas where the pages of the sea are a book left open by an absent master. In the middle of another life, I begin here again. Begin until this ocean's a shut book, and like a bulb, the white moon's filaments wane. Through knowledge, life begins with the twilight of confusion. The process of identifying the meaning of existence is suffused with the power of nature and the absent master. The clarion call to merge dualities of heritage and cultures exists in incompleteness, a mist of uncertainty from which artistic beauty arises. The halfness and the in-betweenness is not the reduction and diminution of dualities. Rather, it creates another life where the confounding confusions merge into an enlightenment of identity, self, nation and world at large. The practice of comparison to find out similarities and dissimilarities between contrasting dualities do not force Walcott to be partial to one, but rather to create a balance between pluralities. The linguistic, cultural, temporal and social in-betweenness provides a surplus meaning, a blend and reconciliation of dichotomies without compromising the reality of himself as an individual and creator of multiple consciousnesses. The castaway is a figure experiencing a blend of being Caribbean and yet discovering the world through the English language. The schizophrenic sensibilities of the mulatto are conveyed in another life as a crystal of ambiguities revealed in a paradoxical flash of instant. The image crystal of ambiguities shows the paradox of his self endowed with the crystal's clarity and not drowned in mystification. Yet what the crystal reflects are multiple, varied and hence not limited to any single identity. Walcott aspires that both disciplines, the both can be the physical binary of Africa and Europe, the artistic binary of poetry and painting, or the binary of the past and present. Walcott aspires that both disciplines would, by painful accretion, cohere and finally ignite. The poet who is poisoned with the blood of both is cursed to be alienated from society as well as the self. The extraordinary world of creativity arising from the chaos of tangled pluralities shows him another life where he has to live in a different gift, its element, metaphor, pointing out that artists are castaways in a state of exile. Walcott received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1992 for his book Omeros. Omeros is the Greek word for Homer and the book is a retelling of the journey of Odysseus. Recontextualizing this journey 
in the island scenario. Gods, heroes and warriors are the fishermen and fisherwomen who live on Walcott's island. While there is a continuous and complex search for a way to heal the colonial wounds and find the roots, the redefinitions of the Greek contexts and the demystification of the Greek heroes itself provides the answer for the questions regarding post-colonial Caribbean identity. In the quest for the self in the post-colonial context, is Walcott going back to the already made canons of literature influenced by the classical epics or is he remodeling the present by transcending the past and moving towards a plural identity with the references to classical texts and contexts and the rewriting of history intertwined with it, Omiros endeavors to recreate past in present which becomes both the pain and the cure. The dichotomies of inheritance from white European grandfathers and grandmothers with slave histories trapped Walcott, the mulatto of style, in the gulf that widens every day. In, Co in Codicil, Walcott explains the dualities experienced by the poet in exile, schizophrenic, wrenched by two styles. One, a hack's hired prose, I earn my exile. The word prose here can mean the French patois or the common language of the colonized, in contrast to the poetic language or the civilized language of the colonizer. The poet is separated from the self and banished from society, twisted in between two sides of borders, which appear at various levels of experience. For Norval Edwards, the relevant features of Walcott's double-headed poetics are his insistence on the plural genealogies of Caribbean culture and his refusal to entertain the pieties of purity and the nostalgia of origins, which define identity from in-between. The Creole language itself is a symbol of in-betweenness. The blend of French patois and standard English, along with words from the local languages. All of these are inevitable to Walcott, the mulatto. Colonization, slavery and migration that brought the new world into being are the basis of the process of creolization in the Caribbean region. The search for ancestral roots does not confine Walcott to a grand narrative or a universal framework. Rather, he gives attention and dignity to everything that he encounters and even the landscape in his poems has a specific identity. The view of life as flux, a world of multiple contradictions and rootlessness are the major themes engaged by Walcott in his poems. But this is not a postmodern flux. Rather, it is a celebration of plural reality that the history of slavery has brought to the Caribbean and which now stands as the basis of a Caribbean aesthetic. As a writer from the Caribbean, Walcott is a primary representation of this unique aesthetics about which we have spoken in many of the modules that discuss Anglophone Caribbean writing. If you refer to the e-text, you will find the poetry of Walcott, which you can read in order to understand. Thank you.